the last two Wednesdays, we've gone through the books of the Old Testament. Today, uh, we're going to be finishing off this mini-series within the series of Rightly Dividing, and uh, we're going to be going through the books of the New Testament. So the title for the sermon tonight is Books of the New Testament. Um, I, re- I really had to edit down my notes. There's a lot of information, and I'll, I'll try to get it done within about 40 minutes as best as I can here, okay? Books of the New Testament. But when we look at Psalm chapter 12, we were given a promise by God there in verse number 6. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So there are two promises there. That the words of the Lord will be purified over time. Okay? And this, I believe, obviously is a great example of, of the, the King James Bible, which we hold and believe. We believe it's the pure Word of God. We believe it's preserved. We believe it's without error. We believe it's a perfect English translation of the original languages. Okay? And so, of course, when it comes to, you know, in the time of Psalms, the, the entire Bible was not written yet. It required a time of purification, of building from, you know, as, as time progressed, as the Lord saw fit to have people write uh, the Bible. But now when the Bible was completed and all six six books of the Bible were completed, the promise that God gives us there in verse number 7, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. You know, there are some that believe or they call the Old Testament writings the Scriptures. But when they think of the New Testament books, they don't think of them so much as the Scriptures as much as the Old Testament. There are some Christians that feel that way. And some think, well, that's just because a lot of the New Testament are the writings of Paul. And so that's just how Paul felt, you know, at that particular point in time. That's just his opinion. No, the New Testament is the preserved Word of God as much as the Old Testament. In fact, the New Testament tells us all about Jesus Christ and tells us now that we have received salvation by Christ, how we ought to live our lives in accordance to that new covenant that God has brought in. But notice what it says there at the end of verse number 8. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. It's not something we like to think about, but this is a common theme of the New Testament books. That yes, the gospel's being uh, preached, people are getting saved, men are uh, growing in the faith, men are being uh, holy, they're overcoming sin, they've been instructed by God how to live righteous life, how to set up churches, how to be organized and orderly and all those kinds of things. But then around these churches, there's always going to be wicked men walking on every side, as was prophesied here in the book of Psalms. There's always somebody wanting to come into the church and defile the Word of God, defile bringing false doctrines. And that's another major element of the New Testament, how to deal with heresy, how to deal with persecution from those that seek to hurt us. So we're going through the books of the New Testament. We're going through the books of the New Testament. And just like the Old Testament could be broken up into different groups, so can the New Testament. So, of course, most people know the first book of the New Testament. In fact, everyone's very familiar with the first four books of the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And these four books are known as the Gospels. The Gospels of Jesus Christ. And they are great books. I mean, these are the the core, the main books that you would really want to get your head into. The books you really want to study the most. You know, read through them. Understand what Christ was like. God manifesting the flesh, walking on earth some 2,000 years ago. You know, we, we, we see Christ honoring the Old Testament, Him keeping Himself perfect, but also bringing in New Testament teaching, and of course, being that ultimate sacrifice for all men. Now, when we start with the book of Matthew, it is the, the, the author of the book of Matthew, of course, is Matthew the Apostle, one of the disciples that followed after Christ. We know him also by the name of Levi in the book of, we cited the book of Luke as a church. He was known there as a, by the name of Levi and Matthew was a publican. He was a tax collector which gave up his full-time job to follow after Christ. And many, many say that the book of Matthew is tailored for the Jews, for, for a Jewish audience. Um, I'm, I'm of agreement in that in general uh, for two reasons. Number one, the book of Matthew does highlight Jesus Christ. Now, if you guys go to Matthew chapter 1, go to Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, it does promote and highlight Jesus Christ as the King of the Jews, as the King or as the Messiah. And of course, this was a promise that was given to Old Testament Israel, the coming Messiah, the King that would come to restore all things through the line of David. But Matthew 1, 1 says, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, and of course, Christ is Messiah, the son of David, 
the son of Abraham. So, of course, the son of David, referencing him as the king, not just the king, but the Messiah, the Christ that was promised to come into the world. So that is the focus of the book of Matthew. The second reason why it is, you know, I, I, would, I would agree that it's, uh, you know, I, I guess tailored toward a Jewish audience is because out of all the other Gospels, it, uh, it, it, uh, you know, it re- references the Old Testament more than any of the other um, Gospels that, that I had. You know, I, you know, I had to kind of look this up. I mean, I, I recognize this just by reading the Bible, that the book of Matthew is just full, just constantly going back to the Old Testament prophets. Uh, but some suggest that there are over 60 times. Some suggest even over 100 times the book of Matthew references, not necessarily directly, but indirectly, Old Testament teachings. So I, I do believe it is tailored toward a Jewish audience, you know, those Jews that were newly saved and, you know, uh, kind of like a book of Hebrews, trying to understand, you know, how, how do we behave from the transition of the Old to the New Testament. But it, nevertheless, it's, it's for all. You know, you can't just say this book is for one group of people and that's it. No, you know, the Bible's been given to all. And the dangers of just saying, well, it's just for the Jews, and that's what some many, of the, many people do, many preachers that hold to dispensationalism, will say it's just for the Jews. And the reason they say that is because we have the clearest and most detailed uh, teaching of the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 with the coming of Christ. And of course, our church believes that's the rapture. But they'll say, no, 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 the book of Matthew is for the Jews. Matthew 24, that's just for the Jews. It's got nothing to do with believing Gentile churches or anything like that. Also, another thing they commonly teach is the book of Matthew has the phrase, the kingdom of heaven. It's the only book that uses that phrase, the kingdom of heaven. The other books reference it as the kingdom of God. When you study it out, there's no difference. God uses that word interchangeably. But the dispensationalists say, well, this is a Jewish book. And the reason it says the kingdom of heaven is because the kingdom of heaven, which strangely is on the earth, not in heaven, but anyway, is just for the Jews. Okay, so you've got to be careful. Yes, we can always say certain books, like the book of Romans, it's tailored to a group of people, it's tailored to the Romans, but that, you can't just, you know, you know go, go down the deep end and just leave it there. No, the Bible's written for all, it's, it's for all, it's for believers, so we can know more of Christ. After the book of Matthew, we've got the book of Mark. Now, Mark is a, a man that you'd be familiar with if you've been reading through the book of Acts, but uh, Mark is the man who joined Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey, but for whatever reason, he returned home. And Paul wasn't happy with him, all right? The Apostle Paul wasn't happy with him. But then Paul and Barnabas, if you remember the book of Acts, they would have a dispute. They would go their separate ways. They would go and, and, uh, uh, you know, um, continue on their ministries to visit churches and and things like that. And Barnabas would take Mark later on with him on his journey, all right? And if you guys can just, no, actually don't turn there. Go Go to Mark chapter, you go to Mark chapter 10. Go to Mark chapter 10. And it kind of sounds bad, you know. You, you, can't, you can't see the personalities there between Paul and Barnabas. Barnabas is the nice one. He gets Paul to go with him. Uh, sorry, gets uh, Mark to go with him. Paul didn't want anything to do with him. But at the end of what, one of the last letters that Paul writes in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, he says, Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. So even though Paul wants nothing to do with Mark for a while, he started to realize, oh, Barnabas got him right. You know, Bar- Barnabas said, you know, uh, got, got him back on board, got him back on track, and now he sees the prophet of Mark, and he wants Mark to come and, and be with him in fellowship and, and minister with him. So there is a good story with Mark at the end of all that, that uh, disputing that went on. But in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, it, it kind of gives us the idea, you know, the, uh, one of the key themes of Jesus Christ in the book of Mark, it says, for even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto. So the book of Matthew is about him being the king, being the Messiah, right? And of course, the king is usually the one you would minister to. So there's a bit of a difference here where it says, for even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So many would look at the book of Mark as as thematically describing Jesus as a minister. Describing Jesus, in other words, saying that is a servant. He was our servant. And this is why the book of Mark um, is, is heavy on miracles. It's, it's probably the, the book that has the most miracles that Jesus Christ did. Because as he was performing miracles, he was healing the sick, casting out devils, making the blind to see, making the lame to walk, all these things. He kept being a minister, a servant to the people. Okay? So that's kind of what the thematic picture of Jesus Christ in the book of Mark is, is him as a servant. Then we've got the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke. And uh, Luke, we don't know much about Luke. He is mentioned in the book of Colossians. Don't turn there. Colossians 4.14. 
which says, Luke, the beloved physician. So that's all we know about Luke, that he was a physician. He was a doctor, you know, as we would, we would term them today. And uh, he wrote the book of, of, of Luke. But the book of Luke, uh, as we've studied as a church, is not a book that is in strict chronological order. It, it is in general chronological order from a big picture, but many of the stories sometimes are not in the same, in, you know, in the, same, in, in the right chronology. You know, Luke wrote in, in, a, in a more uh, topical style uh, gospel. So he kept many of the same stories together, even though they might have been separated by, by many months or many years. But he brought many of the stories close together that were related toward one another. And uh, the, the, generally speaking, Jesus is thematically portrayed in the book of Luke as a man. Okay, the man Christ Jesus, the son of man. You know, talking talk about his humanity. You know, Jesus Christ wasn't just 100% God. He was also 100% man. And that's kind of the theme of the book of Luke there. Then, of course, after the book of Luke, we have John. Please go to John chapter 13. Go to John chapter 13, please. John chapter 13, verse 23. John chapter 13, verse 23. And we know John as another apostle that was taught by Jesus Christ. Um, and it says here in John 13, 23, Now there was a leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. So John would speak of himself in this book as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Okay? He didn't name himself, he didn't call himself by his name, he referred to himself as his third person, and that's who John is. And, um, you know, uh, the book of John predominantly represents Jesus, not as the man, but predominantly as Jesus, our God. You know, the, uh, the, you know, the deity of God, and, and through that as, you know, the Son of God as well. And of course, John 1.1, 1, 1, very clearly in the beginning, you know, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You know, and of course, that later on takes us to Jesus Christ, and so the big picture, the big theme of Christ in that is that He is deity, that He is God Almighty, and that He is the Son of God. So instead of starting with the birth of Christ in Bethlehem, He starts off from the beginning. You know, not only, not only is He God, He's the creator of all things. And um, please go to John chapter 20 now, John chapter 20, verse 31. John chapter 20, verse 31 uh, it's quite a good book in the sense that it gives us the reason why this book is... I mean, many of them do, but this one's a very good reason. John chapter 20, verse 31, it said, But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is, is, is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through His name. Very clearly why the book of John was written, to give you faith, to cause you to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, He's the Son of God, specifically there. And one thing that, you know, with, with our gospel presentations, we go door to door, be sure you include references to John. Because that's, that's the purpose behind it, okay? And, uh, you know, many of us would use some type of variation of the Romans Road, and that's a good book to go through as well to, to describe salvation. But never forget to use John. You know, obviously John 3.16, many of us use that. I use John 3.18 sometimes, John 1.12, when I'm trying to close, um, you know, their need to receive the free gift. Uh, so make sure you, you also add, you know, references of John to your gospel presentation. That was the purpose it was written. We've gone through the four gospels, what they represent and how they show Christ. And it's always nice to have these four. You can compare scripture to scripture, spiritual to spiritual, and get a better, a greater view of the work of Christ on this earth. But then, just like the Old Testament books uh, had a lot of historical books, the New Testament also has a his well, it doesn't have historical books, but he has one history book. Okay, and that's the next one, the book of Acts. The book of Acts is known as the history book or the church, about the church history of the first disciples and the apostles after the ascension of Jesus Christ. It's also known as the Acts of the Apostles. That's why it's called Acts. It's the Acts, the works, the things they did after Christ ascended up into heaven. Please go to Acts 1 1. Acts 1 1. Acts 1 1. The Bible says here, The former treaties have I, have I made, O Theo, uh, Theopolis, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. So notice that the writer of Acts says, Look, I've, I've written a former treatise, O Theopolis, to, to Theopolis, okay, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. 
So the author of Acts says, look, I've written one of the Gospels. I've written one of those where Jesus began to, to do and to teach. And it's very easy to work out who the author of the book of Luke is, of the book of Acts, is, it's Luke. And because in Luke 1, 3, Luke 1, 3, it says, It seemed good to me also, having made perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theopolis, that thou might, mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. So you see, Luke's writing to this Theopolis. You know, both uh, the book of Luke and then the book of Acts. And he, in the book of Acts, he references the former writings that he wrote before of the works of Christ. And so many, you know, see not just Luke as the author, but the book of Acts as a continuation of... I mean, it's basically, it, it picks up straight where the book of Luke left, left off, okay? And it's just a pure continuation of what he had written before. The book of Acts covers a period of about 30 years of church history, uh, again, from the ascension of Christ, and it's, really, it's a really interesting book. So, obviously, it starts with a lot of the work in the church in Jerusalem. And the first, what was it, the first one to twelve chapters deal with primarily, you know, all the disciples, but it focuses on Peter the Apostle. And Peter would have, you know, work in Jerusalem, but also in Samaria, okay? He was focused in the local areas a lot. And, of course, God had instructed them, Jesus Christ had instructed them to go throughout all the world and preach the gospel, so we have those first few chapters dealing with Jerusalem and Samaria. And then chapters 13 to 28 follows the, the, the ministry and the work of Paul. Paul as a missionary being sent out by the church in Antioch to go to other places in the Roman Empire, other places, other Gentile cities, um, other places you know, uh, in, in Asia and things like that. And he went out starting churches, you know, uh, winning people to the Lord, uh, preaching the gospel, starting churches. And those are chapters 13 to 28. Now, Acts is a book where, I don't know if you guys, when you read it, it just seems to end abruptly. Like you have Paul getting arrested, being taken as a prisoner, being taken to Rome. And, and he's talking about how he's going to bring his, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? He's going to bring his, um, his, his appeal, his appeal to Caesar in, in Rome. And, and if, you, if it's the first time you've read through the book of Acts, I'll never forget the first time I read it. I'm like, oh man, I can't wait to see him deal with the, with the Caesar. What's he going to say? What's going to happen? But then it doesn't happen. <laughs> it, just, you know, it just cuts off. It kind of leaves this to be continued feeling in the book of Acts. And I was like, oh man, what happened to it? You know? and, uh, but I think it's done like that on purpose. I think it's done like that to be continued feeling on purpose. So we don't feel like the Acts are done. It's not like a book, oh, the Acts of the Apostles, the, the Acts of the Disciples are finished. It's so we read it and we go, man, it hasn't finished. We got to keep going. You know, we're the ones that have to pick up after Paul and all these apostles and disciples and continue the work of preaching the gospel, continue the work of planting churches, continue the work of, of you know, shining a light to this lost world. And I think that's why it ends so abruptly. So we know, oh, it's not ended. The work is still to be continued. All right, so that's the book of Acts. Then we get on to the epistles. The epistles are another way of saying letters, okay, letters to specific churches, specific groups, or specific people. And most of these epistles were, were written by Paul the Apostle. <clears throat> so we start with the first epistle, Romans. Okay, so obviously tailored toward the Romans, but applicable to everyone. And uh, if you go to Romans chapter 1 verse 10, Romans chapter 1 verse 10, he's writing to a people that he's never met. So at this point in time, he had not met them. Even though we know historically he's on his way to Rome, but when he wrote this letter, he hadn't yet reached there. Okay, so whatever that time frame is. But in Romans 1.10, he says, Making request, if I by any means now at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. So Paul's desiring to go and meet these people, to meet this church, but he's not yet met them. Okay. Now please go to Romans chapter, or oh, actually in the same chapter, verse number 16. Um, it is, the book of Romans is the best epistle in terms of explaining the gospel in great detail. You know, it breaks down in a lot of detail. And in Romans 1.16, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. So at the very beginning, he outlines his reason for writing to the Romans. He wants to explain this gospel of Christ that he's not ashamed of. And he wants to educate them in great detail. So chapters 1 to 11 is basically this gospel presentation in detail, okay? He speaks of our sinfulness. He speaks of God's plan for redemption. 
He calls on people to believe on, on, on the gospel, to call upon the name of the Lord. And, and then that, those are chapters 1 to 11. Okay? Then the, the next chapter, chapters 12 to 16, um, is about how we ought to live in response to salvation. Once we have been saved, once we have now believed and called upon the name of the Lord, how should we live as Christians? So it's, it's, the, it's to have the right response as saved people. Now, if you go to Romans chapter uh, 11, please, Romans chapter 11, verse 36, Romans chapter 11, verse 36, some people, those that want to teach a works-based gospel, will see the end of Romans as, yes, it's work and, you know, living godly, and, and tie that into the gospel of salvation. And say, well, see, it's not just faith, it's works as well. No, but the gospel presentation finished at the end of chapter 11. And if you look at chapter 11, verse uh, uh, 36, right at the end, it says very clearly, for of him and through him, of course, Christ, and to, and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. I love the end of that at the end of chapter 11 because he's finished the gospel presentation and then he just reminds everyone, it's because of Jesus. All right, it's because of Jesus, not because of you. Right, it's for of him, it's through him, and it's to him, all things. You know, salvation is available to us by the finished work of Jesus Christ. So that, that, that's kind of the, the end of that chapter. When you get to chapter 12, okay, now that I've got that, now I understand it's all Christ, what do you want me to do, God? How do you want me to live in your way? So we got to make sure we separate those chapters from those beginning chapters. Okay, then we have 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 please. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and we've studied 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians as a church. And even though it's called 1 Corinthians, it's not the first letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. It's the first letter that God saw fit to canonize for us as his inspired words, okay? But look at 1 Corinthians 5, 9. It says, I wrote, this is obviously Paul to the Corinthian church, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. So he goes, I've already written you an epistle not to company with fornicators, okay? So this is now another epistle talking about that other epistle that he had written, okay? So, um, <clears throat> of course, um, the, uh, Paul was very familiar with the Corinthian church. He had spent some 18 months in the city of Corinth and had many people saved. And he basically established this church. So this is one of those churches that was very, very familiar with the people that were there. And unfortunately, even though he was there for so long... It's one of the worst churches, maybe the worst church you're going to read about in the New Testament. And uh, this is why I started with 1 Corinthians. I said, man, if we get this bad, at least we know what we need to do to fix ourselves, <laughs> right? And if we're not this bad, praise God, you know, we're doing something good. And, uh, you know, what, what encourages me about me when I see these really bad churches is I, I think I would give up on that church. But then I see how God still is able to work with them, that I, God was able to use them and get them back. We'll look at that in 2 Corinthians later. But uh, yeah, it's, it's probably one of the, the worst churches. A lot of divisions within the church, um, just, just carnal believers, babes in Christ, lack of knowledge. You know, they've been infiltrated by false doctrine and false teachers, those kinds of things. They even had somebody in such wicked sin in the church, everybody knows about it. And when Paul hears about it, he goes, what are you doing? Kick this guy out of the church. And again, I'm thankful. Yes, it's a really bad church, a really bad situation, but I'm thankful we have these stories so then we can read this and go, well, now we know what we need to do to kick someone out of the church. We know the sins that, that are so wicked that are committed that we would then need to step in and remove that person from the congregation. So even though it's sad for that church, hey, we get the blessing of learning from that and hopefully not having to go through those same uh, errors that they went through. And so Paul's goal in 1 Corinthians is to bring this divided church back into unity. Then we have 2 Corinthians, and it's a, basically a continuation of 1 Corinthians, and Paul had not yet visited the church. He had planned to. Paul, Paul had lots of plans to visit lots of people. He just can't always make it there, right? You can only do so much as one person. But he had heard good reports from others, from Timotheus and others, that the Corinthian church had turned a corner, they had improved, they had taken to heart the, the letter that he had written to them, and they had done many improvements. So Paul encourages them to continue to keep working toward those things and even to, re to accept the person they kicked out of the church, that the guy had repented, 
and as a church to forgive him, to bring him back to the fold and, and, and continue on as a church. So it also talks about, you know, uh, you know, resolution, you know, resolving issues with people that have been take, kicked out of the church. Um, 2 Corinthians also deals with sending financial aid to other churches, other believers, other brethren in need. And if you remember, the Corinthian church were lacking in that area. So Paul's encouraged them, hey, you know, you had made a, made a promise, basically, to, to send some money. You better complete that. It doesn't look good on you if you don't do that. And uh, it also, 2 Corinthians also helps the church identify remaining false teachers that were within the church. Okay. So this is what I'm talking about. A lot of great things in the New Testament, but many times just those false teachers, those false prophets, they're always there. They're always the wicked, you know, just, just uh, you know, um, trying to get into the church, trying to influence them in a bad way. And, and, and as, I, as I think about these, you realize how important it is to have good leadership in a church, how important it is to have good, faithful men, you know, in a church because these wicked people come in when people aren't ready for it and they can be easily misled. And that's not the only church. There's our other next church, Galatians. Galatians is the next epistle that we read about. And uh, Galatians contains some really great teaching on salvation, on faith, on the finished work of Christ. And the reason for this book is that the church, it's, it's probably strange for us to think about, but this church had fallen away from a clear gospel presentation. They had, again, infiltrators come into the church, beguile them, deceive them. And they started to think of the works of the Old Testament as a possible necessity of their salvation. So the gospel was getting muddied in the church and, and Paul had a great concern. That's why he has such great teaching on salvation by grace through faith. It also is a great book for those that are on the fence on replacement theology and dispensational theology. I mean, the book of Galatians just rips, the book of Galatians just rips apart dispensationalism. I mean, it just does. It, it, it is so clear that um, the physical nation of Israel has been replaced by a spiritual nation of Israel. And our dispensational brothers, they panic over that. They say, oh, what do you think of... Look, the spiritual nation of Israel is made up of Jews and Gentiles, those that have believed on Jesus Christ, okay? The Old Testament physical nation was made up, yes, of believers and also non-believers, okay? The spiritual nation is better, it's made up of 100% believers. The Old Testament nation was made up of some believers and some non-believers. I mean, the spiritual nation is so much better. And it's very clear that that spiritual nation is the Israel of God, you know, since the New Testament has come into effect. All right, let's keep going. The book of Ephesians. If you go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Ephesians is, I think, the first letter... I'm, Pretty sure it is. I mean, he was definitely in prison when he wrote this letter, but I think it's the first letter he wrote while he was in prison. And uh, he doesn't rebuke this church. This ch church seems to be doing things right. He's not there attacking them, abuking, rebuking them about anything. He, if you look at Ephesians 4, 1, it says, I therefore the prisoner, so there it is, he's in jail, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. So he's trying to encourage this church to live a life worthy of the calling, okay? They're doing well. It's like, keep going, you know, keep going. Keep serving the Lord. And uh, not a lot of this book is about salvation directly, though it does touch on salvation. It's primarily about just living holy, blameless lives, you know, uh, going strong for the Lord, standing strong for the faith. That's what it's about. And it's really unusual when I see preachers take the book of Ephesians and try to make it about the gospel. Now, of course, it contains gospel in there. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, we love to quote it, right? But uh, it's not just 8 and 9, verse number 10. I'll just, and it's, it's almost like Paul preempted this, you know, knowing that this book is about works and, and, and walking in accordance to his ways. And so at the, near the beginning, he says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So it's like he just preempts it. Like, let me make this very clear. Salvation is not by works. But you should be working. Okay, you should be doing these things. And that's why in verse number 10, he says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God before ordained that we should walk in them. That, that, that's the purpose of Ephesians. So, you know, he, it's like he, he's, he's, he knows that people are going to use that and teach works-based salvation from that. And so he puts that in there, like just that little nugget of truth to destroy their, their false theology. 
All right, so let's go to Philippians now. Look at the Philippians. Philippians, and this is the second letter that he's in jail. He's in prison. And uh, uh, Paul spent some months, I think maybe three or four months in Philipp Philippi. So um, we also know of the Philippian jailer. We quote this a lot when we go door to door. So in, in Acts chapter 30, or Acts chapter 16, sorry, verses 30 and 31, uh, you know, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Well, that was in Philippi, you know, when, when uh, uh, Paul was over there. And so the, the book of Philippians is basically an epistle of thanksgiving and affection. You know, Paul is saying to the church, I, I love you guys, thank you for your support. They've been sending him financial assistance and necessities for him as he's been going out in the ministry. Did I tell you to go to Philippians 4? No. Sorry, go to Philippians 4.15. 4, uh, Philippians 4.15. And uh, just to sort of support that there, it says here, Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia... No church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. So you see the Philippian church today is just very conscious of Paul and his work and his needs, and they're constantly making sure he's provided for. And so uh, the Philippian church is also a church that Paul never had to rebuke in the pages. He's just showing them his thanksgiving, appreciation, and love for their service. All right, Colossians. So I hope you can see, you know, all these books have a different flavor. Okay, they're all, yes, different churches, but there's a different flavor to each of these uh, uh, epistles. So, the book of Colossians, again, Paul is in prison, and Paul never met this church. Go to Colossians 2, 1. Colossians chapter 2, verse 1. Colossians 2, verse 1, Paul writes, For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you, and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. So, he, hasn't, he has never met these guys, right? And so uh, the Colossian church, unfortunately, had been infiltrated by false teachers, okay, quite severely, had been infiltrated. So look at verse number eight there, Colossians 2, 8, you know, and he warns the church, he says, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, okay? And, and one thing you'll notice in the book of Colossians He's always talking about the deity of Christ. So we saw there that in Christ dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Go back to the previous chapter, Colossians 1, 17. Colossians 1, 17, speaking of Christ, he says, And he, speaking of Christ, is before all things, and by him all things consist. And again, just reinforcing his deity, reinforcing him as the creator of the world. So what I believe by put, looking at the big picture is there were false teachers infiltrating, coming in, and probably denying the deity of Christ. You know, that's probably what's going on. So he's reinforcing, be careful of these people, reinforcing the deity of Christ in this book. All right, the next one is 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians and um, First Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians really go well together. I, I, it's again, it's kind of like a continuation. But 1 Thessalonians, uh, Paul is preparing the church for trials and tribulations. Um, and of course, you know, every church, every, every believer will go through certain trials and tribulations. So Paul's encouraging them, you know, to, to see it through. But of course, it's the most famous book in terms of the rapture. It has the most famous rapture passage in chapter 4. And so then he takes that principle and of course applies it to the end times. We can apply it to the end times of the coming tribulation, the coming persecution. But what's going to get us through these trials, what's going to get us through the tribulations is knowing that Christ is returning, knowing that Christ is going to come back. That's what's going to give us the hope to be able to overcome tribulation and difficulty. Then we go to 2 Thessalonians. And again, like I said, it's just a continuation of 1 Thessalonians. And he uh, explains in more detail about the tribulation, the coming tribulation. Not just standard tribulation, but end times tribulation. And that's why in chapter 2, he spends a lot of time speaking of the Antichrist or the beast. You know, the Bible, well, it's he, the, the son of perdition, the man of sin, all these names that are given to this same person. And so as a church, they would be aware of what would come prior to the rapture, prior to the gathering of the saints into heaven. And so it gives us that great awareness of future uh, tribulation. Again, just holding the hope of Christ's return, and that will get us through those difficulties in those times. Then we have other, after this, we have other epistles that were written by Paul, this time not to churches directly, but to individuals. So we have the next three are 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. 
And these epistles are also known as the pastoral epistles. These are the epistles that I, as your pastor, spend most of my time reading, just over and over again, all right, refreshing my memory. What is it that I need to do as a pastor? Making sure I'm not letting things go, like I'm not accomplishing things that I need to do, you know, and, and at the same time, not getting myself too busy with activities that I don't need to do. You know, that's why these are important pastoral epistles. If you have a desire to be a pastor one day, a bishop, these are the books you need to really get your head into. But First Timothy is writing to Timothy as a younger pastor. I don't know how old he was, but obviously as a younger pastor, he would be less experienced. So Paul writes to him to encourage him in his youth, um, and he teaches him not just how to lead a church, but how to organize himself and how to behave within the church. Okay? And he also outlines in the book of 1 Timothy the qualifications needed for the two church officers, that being the, church, the office of the bishop and the office of a deacon. Because as Timothy grows, as the church would grow, he would need additional men to help him with that church. And then we have 2 Timothy. The, book, the, the epistle of 2 Timothy is about four or five years after 1 Timothy. So you've got now Timothy a lot more experienced. You know, he's, a, he's a lot more mature, a lot more knowledgeable. And so Paul doesn't write in the same way. He, he writes to a more mature pastor, in, in a sense. And if, yes, again, he encourages him as a pastor, as a leader in, in the church. But Paul spends a lot of time sharing to Timothy Paul's own personal struggles, his own personal persecutions and hardships that he's gone through. And um, if you guys go to 2 Timothy chapter 4, go to 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 6. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. The reason I believe Paul is sharing the, these hardships that he has gone through is I believe he's preparing Timothy to go through the same hardships. He's saying, Timothy, this happened to me. This is likely going to happen to you. Okay? So he's, he's warning him. He's preparing him for the difficulties, the hardships that Timothy will go through. Not only that, but here in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, let's read it. Paul says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. So he's saying to Timothy, look, my, my death's around the corner. I'm, I'm soon going to pass on. And so what I think is, you know, Timothy has, has had uh, uh, Paul as a mentor, you know, as, as someone that he could go to for encouragement and guidance. And he's saying, look, Timothy, there's coming a time when I'm not going to be there anymore. And you're going to have to continue the work. You're going to have to now stand on your own two feet, you know, and, and just soldier on, you know, get ready for the coming difficulties. So that's what I think 2 Timothy is about. A more mature pastor, someone who needs to learn to, get, you know, realize you just have to now stand on, on your own faith. I'm not always going to be there to help you. Then we have Titus. Titus is another pastor, um, another pastoral epistle. And look at Titus chapter 1 verse 5. Uh, the Bible gives us a reason why Titus is, is uh, what, what the kind of work that he's doing but Paul says to Titus, For this cause left I thee in Crete, and Crete is an island, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. So Titus had a job to not just have his own church, but to have other church plants, and ordain other pastors, other bishops to oversee those congregations. Now, I've been criticized for having a church down in Sydney by a few people, okay, just, just other, not from this church, okay, and not even within that church, just other people that I know, okay, and it's like, you know, that, it's unbiblical to pass the two churches, well, look at Titus, all right, Titus was, was commanded, obviously there were, in all these cities on this island, in all these towns, there was congregation of believers, and for now, until Titus could ordain elders, or sorry, yeah, um, or, and bishops to oversee those churches, guess who was looking after him? It was Titus, we don't know how many there were, Okay, but I'm assuming there were a couple, there were at least two, three, four, five, potentially. And so he was overseeing all these churches. You know, th did he just want to be the main guy in charge? No, he was there to, to wait for the right person to stand up, wait, wait, for, uh, wait for the right pastors to show up, to ordain that man, and then he could move on and, and, and help the other churches. So it's perfectly biblical to be a pastor of multiple churches. Okay, Titus was that way. Um, but of course, it's, the goal is to install uh, elders in those congregations as well. And so um, it's not just dealing with that, but it's also uh, instructing Titus how to conduct himself with a pastor when it comes to dealing with heresies in the church. Not just heresies within the church, but heretics within the church. And, by, uh, and the principal way by, by dealing with that is ensuring that sound doctrine is being taught behind the pulpit. 
Okay, then we have a, a, a Philemon, Philemon, and this is another epistle where Paul is in prison. And Philemon was a man who had uh, servants under him, and it just seems by, by chance, and of course nothing's by chance when it comes to God, but uh, Paul was, uh, met one of his servants, Onesimus, who had run away from Philemon. And so Paul meets this guy, gets him saved, and he goes, well, now that you're saved, you need to go back to your master. That's the right thing to do. You need to get back under his authority, go back to work. And so he writes this letter to Philemon to say, basically, look, Onesimus, he's got saved. He's a brother in the Lord. Please treat him with love. He's coming back. Please receive him back to em in employment, basically. Okay, so it's a very personal letter to Philemon. And I think it, there's a lot of great truths there with, uh, you know, the relationship between employer and employees. So if you're having difficulties in your workplace, that's probably a good book to, to read through. Okay, then we have other epistles. And these are terminally, uh, uh, terminally, commonly, I'm <laughs> sorry guys, these are uh, commonly uh, labeled as general epistles, general epistles. And the first one under this is Hebrews. Now, I am st strong believer that the book of Hebrews was written by Paul. And I think many of you guys are, right? Many of you guys, we can see the same type of writing, the same type of thoughts. Uh, uh, the, way, the way Paul writes just seems to come through the book of Hebrews. But we don't know for sure. It's, it's not actually written within the pages of the book that is written by, by, uh, by um, Paul. So, you know, I, I strongly believe it was, but I'm not going to be dogmatic. I'm not going to fight you over it, you know, if you don't believe it was written by Paul. But anyway, most likely it was Paul. And... Uh, the book of Hebrews is mostly about the replacements and, uh, of the new co sorry, the replacement of the old covenant with the new covenant, showing that the new covenant is superior to the old covenant. And he's writing to Hebrews or Jews that are believers, that are saved, that have trusted in Christ. Now, of course, I mean, if I, I can understand if I were in their shoes, I'm used to the Old Testament practices. Yes, I've placed my faith in Christ. Yes, I'm now in the New Covenant, I'm in the New, new, you know, in new Testament days, and I can understand the confusion, the, the pressures they may feel to go back to the old ways of doing things. Because there was nothing wrong with the Old Testament practices. God instructed them to do those things, right? It's just that, well, now that Christ has come, put that behind you and follow after Christ, right? That, 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 that's the key thing. That Christ, and that's what the book of Hebrews is all about, is by showing them, look, yes, your, your heart's set on those old ways of doing things, but Christ is, is actually better. Christ has fulfilled all of those things. You know, by putting those things beside, uh, aside and following after Christ, you are keeping those things in Christ, as it were. You know, that Christ had, was, was the picture, was the type, was the illustration of all those things that have come before. And so it was just helping them, you know, de you know uh, uh, detach themselves from the old ways and going after Christ and, and, and being fully you know, living under sort of the, the new covenant ways, if, if you want to look at it that way. And so that was the, basically the, the purpose of the book of Hebrews. A lot of them were, uh, were being pressured to basically go back to the old ways and sort of trust that as a way of salvation, not just Jesus Christ, like mixing, you know, the, the law with Christ. Then we have the book of James. The book of James, and uh, many believe, we don't know, we can't know this for sure, but many believe that this was written by the half-brother of Jesus. It, it, it's my belief also that it was written by the half-brother of Jesus. Um, so, of course, Mary, after she gave birth to Jesus, and Joseph, just like any married couple, had children. One of those was James. And uh, the book of James is a book written about the necessity of believers doing work. Okay? Just, just get into the work. Right? Start being productive for the Lord. Start, you know, working for the kingdom of God. And unfortunately, like every book that has to do with works, there are always those that come and twist what it's about, and they'll say, well, this is salvation. This is about salvation. You cannot be saved by faith alone, but you need works as well. Of course, that's not what it's about, you know. The book of James is about living holy life, a holy life. You know, it starts off with, you know, the need to overcome temptation, overcoming sin, living holy you know, it's not just your faith. Great, you've got the faith. Now do some works. You know, put it into practice. Put your faith into practice and get some works under your belt. It's encouragement for us to get out there, do the works for Jesus Christ, okay? Then we have First Peter. First Peter, of course, Peter, the apostle. Uh, we all know him very, very well. 
And uh, the first Peter is <coughs> written for believers and to en- encourage us to stand out from the world. Not to be just worldly and look like the world and be like the world. No, that we ought to stand out from the world. But the truth in First Peter is also the fact that if we do stand out from the world, that we will face suffering and persecution. And so it's a letter really to prepare us, again, for suffering and persecution, to encourage us through those times and go, well, why has this happened? No, no, no. You should have known this from the beginning. When you start living for the Lord, you're going to suffer. You're going to be persecuted by the world. So that's sort of First Peter, what it's about, to warn us of coming difficulties. Second Peter is to warn us, to warn believers of false prophets and heresies that will, that will infiltrate the church. So again, you see that, that same theme coming through many of these books. Um, and again, how do we overcome these things? How do we overcome the difficulties? By holding on to the hope of the coming of Christ and, and to live in accordance to that promise, to hold on to that promise. Please go to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4 reads, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So just prompting us, you've got so many promises, so much to look forward to. You know, live like, like you were, like live after those promises today. You know, so that's what Second Peter is about. Then we have First John, Second John, Third John, and um, of course, it's the same John that wrote the, the Gospel of John. So First John, and, and these books are very similar in, in a sense. It's a lot about um, fellowship and love, these three books but the sort of targeted toward three different groups. And uh, 1 John is, uh, sort of has a very blunt uh, description of what is right and wrong. You know, it speaks of Christ, and it speaks of the Antichrist. You know, it speaks of the love of the Father and the love of the world. And it's like, where are you? You know, you're, you're either in one place or in your, you're in another place. And so, you know, it, it's making sure that we, we understand the, the difference between what is right and wrong. And of course, when it deals with the love of the Father, that is the love that, that John is, is seeking for us to have in our lives. In order for us to love properly, in order, in order for us to have the proper expression of love to God and against you know, that, that which is wicked, we need to have the love of the Father with us, the fellowship that we need to have with, with the Father. So that's First John. Second John is also about fellowship, but in reverse. So it warns us not to fellowship and not to befriend false teachers. You know, not to bid them Godspeed and, 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 and you know, um, you know be, be an encouragement. No, no. You know, there are certain people we, we are to not fellowship with, right? We, we've got to keep the difference between light and darkness. And otherwise, these people will come in and just influence your life, you know, and turn you against the Lord. So that's Second John, okay? It's, it's fellowship, but not to fellowship with certain people. Then we have Third John. And again, Third John's about love and fellowship. But this time, it's, it's more about expression toward the brethren in the church, our brothers and sisters in the Lord. Yes, I mean, 1 John has a lot of that as well, but 3 John kind of focuses, narrows in on that as well, just having unity, love, and fellowship with brethren within your local church. Then we have the book of Jude. The book of Jude, please go to Jude 3, verse 3. There's only one chapter, Jude, verse 3. And uh, I feel sorry for Jude because uh, he says here, <laughs> he goes... Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, he goes, I, I'm about to, I was about to write to you about salvation, about the gospel, right? And then he goes, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God unto lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So he wanted to just write about the common salvation, but then he saw it needful to write about false prophets. All right, so those that are going to creep into the churches and, and hurt them. So it's like this urgent warning. He was going to do something else, but now like, I need to urgently warn you. Okay, that there, are, there are people in your midst, or there are people that are going to come and teach you false things. And that's, what, that's the urgency we need to have with false doctrine. You know, people come in wanting to teach their false doctrines, we need to act with urgency and get rid of that, 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 that leaven before it leavens the whole lump, you know. Then we have the final book, which is Revelation. 
And of course, like, you know, the Old Testament had a lot of prophets, and they prophesied of the future many times. Well, we have one book of prophecy, right, in the New Testament, and that's the book of Revelation. Book of Revelation. And it's called Revelation because it reveals. It reveals the end times. It is a full, concise, and clear presentation of the end times. I love it. There was a time when I couldn't understand it, and I just, I found it very hard to get through. I'm excited for the time I can actually preach it to this church because it just, it just shows us so much about the future events. And that's what a lot of people are excited about. A lot of people are just, what's the future hold? What does God say? The book of Revelation is full of it, and it's clear. And unfortunately, so many people miss it, misunderstand it. They split it up into so many sections, and it just becomes unreadable. No, it's actually pretty readable. It's pretty, uh, it, it's in chronological order, almost all the way, just halfway, it starts again. But anyway, just uh, not going into that, but basically it teaches us about the coming collapse of the world systems, governments and finances, and uh, that's going to come through worldwide warfare that will come into this world, and the beast or the Antichrist will take full advantage of that, of that situation, set himself up, bring in a new financial system, the mark of the beast, and cause tribulation to come upon the saints. He'll come and lead persecution against believers, and many, many believers will lose their lives for the Lord, okay? That's the coming tribulation that First Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians also warned us about. And, um, of course, it's not just about the tribulation. It's the hope of Jesus Christ's return, that He's coming again, that He's going to rapture His saints at the third seal, uh, sorry, at the sixth seal, when the sun and moon are darkened and the Lord comes back. We're in heaven with the Lord forever. Once He takes us safely into heaven, God's going to pour out His wrath the full measure of his wrath, okay, upon this earth, upon the beast, upon the, the, those that took a mark of the beast, and just totally wipe out the, the earth as we know it. I mean, no mountain will be left, <laughs> basically standing. And then after that wrath of God, Jesus Christ comes back on the horses with, with all the believers and finally destroy the last armies of the Antichrist, set up his thousand-year kingdom to rule and reign with us forever, on the fr we'll be there with Christ, you know, maybe having thrones, I don't know. You know, the work we put in today, guys, will affect our positions in that coming kingdom. And then when that thousand years is over, Satan will be finally destroyed in the lake of fire, and God will create a new heavens and a new earth. So there's a great end to the story. Um, those are the books of the New Testament. Thank you guys for being patient. And I hope that's helped you understand the New Testament a little bit better. Let's pray.